to introduce Andrew Tripp, uh, who is currently studying philosophy at DePaul University. Um, and he is the founder and leader of the DePaul Alliance of Free Thought, DAFT. Um, and I don't know if everybody knows this. DePaul is a Catholic university. Um, so he has, a, he has an interesting milieu which he is operating within, uh, which I'm sure uh, brings a, a unique, well, if not unique, but a uh, fascinating perspective to his uh, work as a Secular Student Alliance group leader. So please join me in welcoming him. Well, look at this lovely all-white audience. Oh, excuse me. Pardon me. With a token minority. So it just lo what, this, what this audience looks like to me, it just, you know, just looks like the speaker's list of Tam right now. I, 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 I'm, a ba I'm a bad person. I apologize. Um, <laughs> all right. So. So, hi, I'm Andrew. Uh, as August said, I go to DePaul University in Chicago, which despite being the nation's largest Catholic university, uh, barely deserves the name. Um, we, it is the largest Catholic university, but aside from the fact that the guy in charge is a priest and we can't distribute contraception officially, uh, there really is absolutely nothing Catholic about DePaul. What we do do at DePaul rather well uh, I like to think is activism. Uh, it's a university. The Vincentian Order has always, you know, they are still Catholic, but they were founded not by the church, but by this guy, St. Vincent de Paul in France. And it was all about helping poor people and wonderful things like that. So I can give the Catholics a little bit of a slide, given to the fact that the university does do a genuinely enormous amount of good work for the community. So I'm here to talk about getting out of the basement. It's a metaphor I think is unfortunately still appropriate uh, for our movement at this point in time in that as of, as of so far, we've done a very, very good job of forming communities with SSAs, with CFIs on campus, uh, you know, local groups, etc., with coming together, meeting, usually drinking in my experience, and uh, you know, hanging out. And that's awesome. And groups that just want to do that should absolutely, you know, do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but at the same time, you know, in the wider media, it doesn't seem to me like the like the atheist and secular movement is taken particularly seriously. You know, there will be the usual number, the usual number of of. Uh, religious people who will shriek and scream when an a when an atheist is running for office or whatever. But the moment at the moment there isn't really a particularly, at least widely known, political and activist presence to atheism, particularly among the groups that should be our absolute strongest allies, in my opinion, being fe being feminist and queer groups. In my experience at DePaul, these groups because of atheism's history of being, uh, well, really white and really male. Um, thanks to this problem, this is my first problem, is this issue of reductionism. If you haven't read uh, Daniel Finke's uh, interview with Richard Wade on Friendly Atheist, I highly recommend it because he defines it very, very well. But basically, being white male academics into science and analytic philosophy, we like this fill the position comic system we're all we're all atoms that's all we're made up of at the end of the day and that's wonderful that's true that's you know scientifically true but what that ends up happening with and dan makes a very interesting point in some of his posts about uh the recently converted leo labresco in that having this this system when you do this you it essentially removes Conver removes issues from the conversation that have less easily definable truths. With this, there's one truth. Atoms, molecular bonds, all that good stuff. It doesn't include for things like ethics, metaphysics, things like that, things that do not readily have objective answers to them. So, when it comes to, so socially, when it comes to this movement, one of the things that we've noticed very, very much is those issues with less easily definable answers for most of us that we don't know much about, namely sex and gender and race issues. Then we have things like this pop up. 
Uh, I've seen that top t-shirt around here a few times. Uh, it's problematic for a number of reasons, uh, namely that it seems to me and it seems to people, to atheists of color who I've talked to, what this shirt says to them is that we are all Africans, just like we're all Adams. Technically, way back when, yeah, we all came out of Africa, but in a present day, in a present circumstances, a lot of people of color I've talked to look at that shirt and say, hey, what? You're kind of, I know, it's, it's, it's read by a lot of people, by a lot of non-white people as being essentially trying to erase the issues that are inherent in particularly the African American community. Uh, the bottom one, I don't think I really need to talk about. <laughs> if you really want to, uh, Sakivu Hutchinson wrote a an amazing post about it, but I mean, billboards, not the most sophisticated form of communication. You put that up in a heavily African-American neighborhood with a character of a slave in the shackles, you're not gonna see the little atheist part at the bottom. You're gonna see somebody saying, slaves obey your masters brought to you by whoever, and it's just, it's a really, really, it can be a very, very triggering image, and uh, it's, it's just basically, it's very heavy handed and not a good thing. So basically, this ignorance of race issues in our overwhelmingly white and male movement leads to what in my experience, and particularly in the comments I've been recently getting on a blog post I had on Dispatches from the Culture Wars, is that privilege is to, to a lot of atheists the filthiest word on the damn planet. <laughs> it's like you, a, lot of, a lot of atheists I talk to hear this word and just go, no, no, we're not. We're not privileged. We're not privileged. Why? I've earned my way here because self-determination and all of these things. And I. <laughs> so I'm trying really hard not to swear because I don't have a swear jar. Um, but so basically, when we have these pr privilege, what basically what privilege means is that we're not talking about necessarily about being super rich and wealthy and and you know having palaces and and being ferried everywhere on those roman chariots uh we're talk what we're talking about is what Pe peggy mcintosh who wrote an amazing article called unpacking the invisible knapsack which everybody needs to read if you haven't already um refers to as uh, any, these, it's the levels of unearned advantages, unearned being the important thing, unearned advantages that a dominant gro group holds over all others. So when it comes, when it comes to this, so this is a map of the city of Chicago where I live. So this is mapped by Bill Ranklin, who is a uh, socialist geographer, does great work. So basically what this map is showing you is that are the intensely is the intensely segregated nature of the city of Chicago, which is, I don't know if it's number one anymore technically, but we're way up there in terms of being the most intense, in terms of having incredibly strongly segregated racial groups across neighborhoods. You'll notice that the north, that the north side of Chicago is uh, intensely white, and the south side is very, south and west sides, very, very black, very, very Hispanic. So, and then the outer lying areas that are all pink, those are all suburbs. Also, as you might imagine, very, very white. Um, so what this, so what this comes to is means when I go to, De when I go to DePaul University as a white male, tall white male, uh, who's generally, people tell me I dress well and I don't really believe them. Um, <laughs> And what this means is I can walk around my north side neighborhood surrounded by overwhelmingly white people and more often uh, soccer moms with like four wide thousand dollar strollers. Um, what it means is when I walk into a convenience store, into DePaul, into wherever I'm going in Lincoln Park or uptown where I live is I'm not immediately going to be seen as a subject of intense suspicion by law enforcement. 
Uh, what this means as a white man of privilege is when I speak up in class, um, a professor or my fellow students will more are, have been shown to be more likely to believe me as a source of authority, no matter what the hell I'm talking about. Um, what this means is I can walk down the street in a hoodie and not get shot for looking, for looking suspicious, i.e. the Trayvon, Trayvon Martin case that happened recently. Um, as a white, there, the list of, th these are all, this is all privilege that I hold. I could have come to this, I could have come to this conference and given a talk on anything else. I could have happily lived away my wonderful, wonderful days of white privilege forever and ever and ever and never thought thought a second word about it. No, never, never thought about it, never would have had to think about it because as a white male, I am not subject to really any societal oppression. I don't remember who wrote this blog post, but um, uh, you look it up, but basically described being white and male in uh, video game terms as being the easiest difficulty setting. It, it's, it's, the na it's the narrative setting on Mass Effect 3. You don't really have to work very hard and you get all of the wonderful stories and acclaim and things like that. Um, oh good, I have some nerds in the audience, awesome. Um, so, uh, in essence, so, I mean, the list of pr this list of privilege goes on and on and on. I was not smart enough to go and uh, get things printed out before the copy center closed uh, yesterday. But if you go to uh, the website of uh, the Transformative Justice Law Project of Chicago, which is tjlp.org, uh, they have a, a, a great handout there called Privilege 101, which does a really great job of going through and uh, listening to all this. So, when it comes to... I, white male privilege, what this also comes to is something I've been accused of deliberately ignoring, um, is religious privilege. This is, you know, we all know about, we all know about this. We talk about these things all the time. We talk about social justice issues in atheism all the time, but they don't come under the heading of social justice, which has become a dirty word associated with those flippy floppy hippy dippy liberation theologists. Um, so we, I mean, in atheism, what do we what do we like to talk about when we're when we're trying to debunk religion? We talk about how misogynistic the Bible is. We talk about how the Bible tells you to stone gay people and adulterers. We tell you know. So we talk about uh, we talk about closet. We talk about closeted preachers. We talk about. Catholic, Catholic priests and sex scandals and things like this. These are all issues directly relating into what I'm, what I'm talking about here. When we, when we talk about how the Bible is misogynistic and how, the, and how women really shouldn't be treated that way, you're making a feminist point. I know that's another big dirty word, just right under privilege, but <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, a femi it's a feminist point. If you think women should be equal, then you are a feminist. That, that, if, if, for instance, you think that uh, top left here, Trayvon Martin, should not have been shot and that, his, and that his probable killer should not have received over $3 million in legal donations for essentially killing him and being on the run for ages is a bad thing, then you are and then you are in favor of the reform of the criminal justice system. If you think that C.C. McDonald in the top right corner there, who is a trans woman of color, who was recently sentenced to, I believe, uh, about a year in jail because she defended herself from a mob of transphobic attackers who wanted to kill her because she was a trans woman of color. She has been sentenced to a year in prison in which she will be placed in the male ward of the prison where she, so she will not be with the, with the gender she identifies, she will not receive any of the medical treatment that goes, that goes, along, with trans, with, goes along with transitioning, that means no hormones, almost no psychological help, none of that. If you think that's wrong, then 
you're a social, then you like social justice. You like the, the, that's as easy as it is. If you think that Paige Clay on the bottom left hand corner should not have been shot in Chicago on April 9th just for being trans, then you like social justice. If you think that Brandy Martell should not have been shot in DC two weeks later, then you should be a social justice activist. If you think that Agnes Torres Solca, who was a Mexican trans woman who was tortured for hours and then killed in Mexico in July of, 2000, in July of 2011, then you should be a social justice activist. Our atheist issues that we talk about so much that you know may, may not be crutches to just beat on religion a little bit more, if you think that these things are wrong, that they are unjust, then you as atheists should step out, talk a, maybe a little less about, maybe a little bit less about science and whether in God we, we trust should be on the money, which are still important issues, and take things up like this. Now, my critics will tell me that that's not very, <laughs> <laughs> that I'm making, <laughs> I enjoy white men tears more than anything else. <laughs> Bring on, because I, if, you, if you are making the point that the Bible is misogynistic without also saying that women should not be harassed just for existing and not be seen as purely sexual objects, if you can't make that connection and call yourself a feminist and maybe undirty the word a little bit, then Quite frankly, I'm going to go over to Students for Justice in Palestine at DePaul, who are overwhelmingly, uh, who are all Muslims, I believe, who do believe that, who do believe that the incredible rate of transphobic violence, of which I have the stats here, uh, the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs found that in 2010, 44% of LGBTQH, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and uh, HIV-affected murder victims were trans women. And in 2009, trans women were 50% of all LGBTQH murder victims. This is when, tran when trans people consist of 1% of the entire queer population, which is, again, about 1% to 2% of the entire U US population. I believe it's an overwhelming rate of violence. It's an incredible rate of violence. And if you don't think that as atheists, these are issues that need to be discovered, then like I said, I'm going to go over with the believers and hang out and hang out with them and do social justice activist work with them. Because at the end of the day, it does not matter what particular God, po probably imaginary, you believe in. What matters is that we are walking the walk and that we are doing work to change the world, to change the world for everybody and to make it an equal, and make it an equal place where nobody is, for, is under the constant threat of violence just for being who they are. And frankly, like I said, if it's a, if it's a believer who wants to do that work with me, then I don't care that they believe. I care that they're doing the work and I will take them over an atheist activist any day because I believe fully something that one of my professors told me last year, that silence is acquiescence. If we don't speak up on these things and we are allowing, then we are saying we're cool with letting this happen. And I don't think any of you in this room think that it's cool that any of the things I just briefly mentioned, which are just the tip of an overwhelming iceberg, I don't believe that any of you think that's cool. I may be way out of line in saying that, in which case I've really like thought this gone for something else. But you know, <laughs> but I don't believe that is because August is really cute. Uh, so, if you want to talk more, if you want help with resources, with organizing. Uh, people to talk to, come talk to me. It's my Twitter it's my, and my, the two blogs I write for, and I Can America Too, Ron Paul. Um, so there are so many resources out there. There are so many things that your groups can do. There was a talk on Planned Parenthood earlier. Go, be a, go volunteer to be um, a clinic 
escort, volunteer. There are plenty of LGBT advocacy groups in your area, I'm sure. You get, can get involved, get our names out there as being allies of these groups, and our movement will grow and we will make some actual change. Thank you.